number 15. It's no accident, though it was not completely planned, that the, the theme of the music worship part of our service would tie in directly to the message. It's not that each Sunday that we try to coordinate those two things and this, just the way the Lord had it to be, it ties in just like God would want it this morning. First Corinthians chapter number 15, we're going to come to a passage that clearly explains in a few verses the gospel. Our theme for this year is living the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, we will find explanation in a simple, short format of what the gospel is. I want to challenge us this morning to not only live the gospel, but a very specific way to live the gospel this morning and this evening. This theme is not just something that we needed to have at First Baptist Church. Living the gospel theme was not just come about because, boy, we need to have something to put on the screens and put on the wall, and, and then we'll just make some mugs and some cups go along with it, but something that, that I believed and believe that needs to touch our heart and life. It's not lost on me the problem, the conflict in the Ukraine, and I hope that you're praying for the Christians there in the Ukraine right now, that you lift them up because they are not exercising the same, the same freedoms that we enjoy this morning. They do not have the same sense of security that we have gifted to us this morning. During the service, there are no, really no threat of a, a missile attacks or soldiers coming in. There is no consternation like what will happen after the service. We are blessed this morning with some security that God has given to us. May we not waste that security. May we not take it for granted in these moments, as Paul said, but by the grace of God. Could be us. And woe and shame to us who would not lift up our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. This morning, as far as I could have heard and have been told, are not complaining. Are not even downhearted. They're concerned, for sure, as we all would be, but rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Praying for his power, his protection. And may we, who have the ability to spend the time, spend the time with Jesus Christ for them. But we not get so caught up in our days, in our, in our just our busyness of life, eating lunch, that we forget to lift up before the Holy One of Israel, the God of the universe, those requests. And let your requests be made known unto him. Let, you can tell God of those things, ask him those things. So as we come to live in the gospel, those things are not lost on me. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, if you could look please in verses 1 through 4, where Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pens these words, Moreover, brethren, he's preaching now, he's writing to the Christians. This is an important part we'll come back to, but notice he is not at this point. When he says brethren, he is writing to those who are saved. Right? This is not a message right here to the unsaved, but to the saved. Do you see that? More of a brethren. He's writing to those who are saved. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day According to the scriptures, Lord, I thank you for the moments that we have, and I ask that our hearts would be touched by your word and by your spirit. Lord, would you challenge us this morning? Would you please use me in some small capacity, some small way, Lord, to further your kingdom this morning? But Lord, may we as soil be good soil. And Lord, as you speak to us, would we please respond to you? And Lord, I ask that there's someone here either in this building or online or the sound of my voice, who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today they would trust you. And Lord, I'm thankful for the gospel, for your salvation, which you freely offer to everyone who believes. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for 
as the Son of God, allowing yourself to go through that and being obedient and submissive, even to the death of the cross. And God, thank you for the gift of salvation. And Lord, may we believe and accept, and then may we allow it to transform our life every single day. Lord, we pray for your help this morning. We need you. I need you. In Jesus' name, I ask, amen. I'd like you, if you would, to hold your finger in 1 Corinthians and turn to Romans chapter 1. Under this context of living the gospel, I wanted to take a step back this week and look at a trap that we fall prey to. And this morning, as we look at the gospel, this will be a very specific application of this particular message, and then tonight we'll see another application from this concept in slightly different light. But in, Mark, in, sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul lays out the gospel. The gospel, quite simply, is the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Not by accident, all right, not by happen chance or circumstance, but on purpose, Jesus Christ came to earth. Through the plan of God, Christ came as a willing sacrifice to die for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he died, was buried, and rose again. The gospel is not the gospel without the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without those three aspects, there is no gospel. It is not a gospel, it is not good news that someone died. That happens, unfortunately, every day of the week. It is not good news that someone is buried. Someone rising again, that's good news. But when it is the Son of God, that is the best news. This is the gospel. And Paul articulates to the church at Corinth, writing to the believers, listen, he goes, I've preached this unto you, and this is effective in that you believed it. If you have your finger there in 1 Corinthians, look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we come across an interesting passage again by the pen of Paul. We'll look at it this morning and this evening. But Paul is writing to these people in Rome. And he's writing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's going to argue in the book of Romans how people are sinners, but how that God loved them and Jesus died for them. Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. This will be a theme throughout Romans. But in Romans chapter 1, in verse number 15, he says, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul says, I have not been able to, but I'm ready to preach the gospel. We find out early in the passage that he's not been to Rome yet. But in verse number 16, he makes this profound statement. He says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now would you please read these words with me again at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Read it with me, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, if you would, please keep your finger in 1 Corinthians and flip back to Mark chapter number 8. Mark chapter number 8. A place where we were at the last two weeks. Mark chapter 8, we looked at this concept of losing ourselves, being lost for the gospel's sake. Jesus in Mark chapter 8 in verse 36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be, it's the next word, ashamed of me. And of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. What happens? What happens when someone is ashamed of the gospel. What happens when we are ashamed of the gospel? Paul loudly proclaims in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is as if Paul takes a poster board and in big letters says Jesus Christ and holds it up. I am not ashamed. But what happens when someone becomes ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
This morning, this evening, just two aspects of this concept of being ashamed of the gospel. I believe it is a trap that we can fall into, and tonight I want to deal with what happens when Christians are ashamed of the gospel. But this morning, a slightly different look, a different aspect of this concept of being ashamed. The word ashamed here means to be embarrassed or to be reluctant of the gospel. To be embarrassed or to be reluctant of the gospel. And this morning, I want to deal with the concept, what happens when we're embarrassed or reluctant with the acceptance or the belief of the gospel? I realize that on a Sunday morning at First Baptist Church, there are many people here who have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I believe from the depths of my soul, the bottom of my heart, that in a room this size and with the online presence as well, that there are those who are here who have never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are ashamed. They are embarrassed or reluctant of the gospel. They're embarrassed or reluctant to accept the gospel. This may be your first day here at First Baptist Church, your first week here, or it may be your thousandth week here at First Baptist Church. This may be the first time you sat in a pew here at First Baptist Church, or perhaps you've been baptized when you were young here at First Baptist Church. But I don't want you to miss this concept, this idea that we must, every single person must themselves individually believe for themselves the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anything less than that is unbelief. Anything less is disbelief, and I'm afraid that there are those who will worship among us. There will those who will sit among us, who will be among us, who will not be with us forever and ever in eternity with Jesus Christ because they are ashamed of the gospel or they're ashamed of their lack of belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this morning I wish to challenge us on this thought. I know, or I imagine some will sit here and say, well, Pastor, great, I, I accepted Jesus Christ years and years ago, but don't, don't let me lose you yet. Because most likely you'll come across somebody, if you've already said to Jesus Christ, you'll come across someone who needs this right here. I'm going to come to the part where I'm talking to people who have sat in church their whole life, but don't for a moment think that just because someone sits next to you in the aisle that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Right? Accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior is an intensely personal, individual decision. I can't make it for you, and you can't make it for me. I don't know if you're sincere, and you don't know if I'm sincere. Now, you can judge, we can judge by fruit, some works or some things. We can say, look, it appears that the Holy Ghost is working inside of you, and I know if I've trusted Jesus Christ, and you know if you have, but it's an individual thing. I can't force Johnny, James, or Danielle to trust Jesus Christ, though I wish I could. Though I wish I could. I wish I could do every single person, but all I can do is preach the gospel. Declare the gospel, give the gospel, promote the gospel, talk about the gospel, invite to the gospel, to, to challenge someone to embrace it, but you must and I must individually not be ashamed of the gospel. Now tonight we'll deal with the aspect of how we're ashamed to live for the gospel. All right, so come back tonight at 6 o'clock for that message if you want to be challenged and convicted and have Holy Spirit touch your heart. But this morning is about accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are three parts, three, three points this morning I want to make. The first point is this. In the gospel, there is the hope of the gospel. Why is this a big deal? And it's a big deal because it's about Jesus Christ. This is what Paul tells in Corinthians. It's a big deal because it's about Jesus Christ. And my friend, I don't know how long you've been saved, but I hope you never grow tired of hearing about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who born of a virgin and lived a sinless life. This is the gospel. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But he clarifies that in Romans 1, 16. And he says here in 1 Corinthians, here, let me tell you about the gospel which you've received of how that Christ died for our sins. The hope of the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ answers life's greatest questions. Jesus Christ meets life's greatest needs. See, the gospel reveals our need of a Savior. The gospel reveals that I am a filthy, rotten sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And I don't care 
how good you may think you are, the Bible declares you, declares me to be a sinner. But if I'm honest, I already know that. Now, I may not think I'm as bad a sinner as someone else, like Brother Kemp. Obviously, he's a really bad sinner. Let's see, there's some amens. There we go. They know you like I do. No, no. And I'm just kidding with you, of course. But we often compare, do we not? I'm not as bad as so-and-so. But if I'm honest with me, if I'm honest with J.D., I'm a sinner. And you're a sinner. The gospel reveals my need. And that, this is why false religions can grab such a foothold, because people feel the need. They feel the need. And because of that need, then they want to get past that need, attain to a different level, whether it's a false religion of earning their salvation, of being good, of joining a certain church, or living a life of sacrifice for a false god. The gospel reveals a need, but if we're honest, we already know that in our hearts there is a need, that we are sinners and we have a need of a Savior. The gospel reveals our need, but reveals our Savior, Jesus Christ. And though we have not seen him, one day we will see him face to face. Sometimes people ask, well, what are you looking forward to in heaven? Jesus. Jesus. There's loved ones who are on before us. There are saints who had some amazing stories in Scripture, but we're going to heaven because of Jesus. That's who we will see, desire to see. The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The hope of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ not only came to earth and was not only a powerful teacher. He was a powerful teacher. He turned the religious, the religious people on their heads. The experts in the law. He put them into theological pretzels. Jesus was a powerful teacher. When they came to trick him, he, he asked questions. He said things, and they're scratching their heads. And I know when they walked up, they thought they were going to win. We've got this. We've got this humble carpenter son now. Missing the fact that he is Scripture. He's the Word himself. You can't trick Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ, not only a powerful teacher, not only kind and compassionate. The Bible says in Acts that he went about doing good. Healing, supplying, everywhere Jesus went, he did good things. Can you imagine being alive during that time, having the ability to have a loved one healed just like that? A child who could not walk now could walk. A man who could not see now could see. And a daughter who would be possessed by devils now clean. In the, and, 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 Chloe, and, and in her right mind, the maniac of Gadara, who was a lost case by everyone's rule of thumb, Jesus Christ transformed. Not only was he a powerful teacher, he went about doing good things. But just teaching things while and doing good things is not enough of salvation. Hope of the gospel then found that Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, crucified in terrible pain and agony. In fact, the word we get excruciating comes from the word, the base word of the crucifix, crucifixion. Those things are linked together. And Jesus Christ suffered excruciatingly for us. Died for our sins. Powerful words he spoke on the cross while he hung there in agony. And these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If that's all we knew of Jesus Christ, we could see his heart of compassion. Not the same heart that we always have. And buried his disciples, his followers, thought it was over. They thought it was done. We read scripture, and I've read through the Gospels, and you see how Jesus is prophesying of his resurrection. And the disciples missed it. They missed it. I look at the disciples, and I say, boy, how could you miss this? How could you miss this? But the fact that I, I miss things from Jesus all the time. Hope of the Gospel. Like we read this morning in Luke, the ladies come to the tomb, and the angels say, 
Why seek ye the dead among the living? He is not here, for he is risen. <laughs> come see the place where the Lord lay. Hey, listen, you, you, you can come by. It, 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 it's a national monument now. It's where Jesus Christ laid for just a little bit of time. You can come see that. He's not here now, though. The hope of the gospel. Found in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't only see the hope of the gospel, though I see the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. There's the hope of the gospel, which is Jesus. But there's the heart of the gospel, which is the love of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the love of God. The love of the gospel, it was the love of God that sent Jesus to the cross. The love of Jesus that kept him on the cross. Sometimes, things done in love are misinterpreted. Parents, we experience this sometimes on a regular basis. A decision done in love, made in love, of profound love, of deep love, can be misinterpreted by children. Misinterpreted as if, Mom and Dad, you're trying to ruin my life, when in fact, as a parent, you're trying to preserve their life and save their life. Things done in love can be misinterpreted. And there are times that because of the love of God, this love of God through Jesus Christ, it has been misinterpreted. People don't view Jesus as the love of God. They view it as the rule of God. Well, that's, that's not fair that God would only have one way of heaven. But remember, the heart of the gospel is the love of God. And whether I interpret it the right way or not does not change the fact that the love of God was what was spearheading the gospel for you and for me. Whether I view it that way or not does not change the truth of the equation. You see, we put such a high view on our own perspective. We say, oh, well, if I see it this way, then it must be true. All right, and you can't tell me that I'm looking at this wrong. And this happens in almost, in almost every situation. If I view it this way, well, then you can't tell me I'm wrong because I viewed it this way. And it comes back to the gospel where we view the gospel. People can view the gospel the wrong way. And it may misinterpret the heart of the gospel, which is the love of God. But this morning, it's not where I want to stop. I want to stop on the hindrance of the gospel. This morning, as we sit here this morning, you sit here and you listen. There are some here who have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. You say, Pastor, how can you know that? Because Jesus himself said, there will be many that say, Lord, Lord, have we not? Jesus says, there will be many who will appear that they've accepted me, but they have not accepted me. I am not here this morning to make you doubt your salvation. I'm not here to make you doubt God's goodness in your life. I am here to challenge with this question, have you individually, personally, yourself, trusted in Jesus Christ and him alone and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Has there been a time in your life when you say, yes, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus and him and him alone? I've been out so long and I've been told this, well, I've always been a Christian. My friend, you've not always been a Christian. You're not born a Christian. You're not always a Christian. There's a time, Jesus said it this way to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. A very definite time where you say, now, you may, not, you may not remember the exact day that you were saved. I don't put stock in just in like, well, I remember, now, you know, July 4th, 19, whatever. If you have that, great. You've had that, great. But there ought to be a time when you remember trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I was six years old when I did this. I remember trusting Jesus Christ. I can't tell you who the lady was in front of me. I can't tell you that. But she's not saving me. I can't tell you who else was around me that day, but they're not saving me. I can't tell you where the temperature was outside, though it was in Florida, so I imagine it was beautiful and sunny. Just the odds. But I can tell you that when I was six years old, I remember, I remember when I asked Jesus to save me from my sin. I remember when I trusted Jesus Christ. Can you remember? Trust Jesus Christ. 
What causes us to be ashamed of the gospel? Well, sometimes it's fear. It's fear that causes the reluctance. Sometimes fear from family. Sometimes fear from friends. I imagine that there will be other, other people who have been in good churches who preach the gospel who will not be saved because they feared what other people would think when they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They'll be afraid of what others will think if they were to say, well, I just trusted Jesus Christ. That They're afraid that people would say, oh, I thought you were saved. And they're afraid of what someone else might say to them, the fear. They'll be ashamed of the gospel, reluctant and bears of the gospel because of what someone else might say. Well, you've been in First Baptist Church your whole life and you're telling me you just got saved? My friend, I'm here to tell you this morning that if today you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't know of anyone in this room who would look down on you for that decision. I don't know of anyone in this room. I don't know of anyone in this room who would say, boy, you really blew it. I know of many people in this room who would say, wow, praise the Lord. I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. That's great. And that goes if you've been here just one day or if you've been here a thousand days. But fear will cause us to be ashamed. Men by the name of Aaron. Aaron was his first name. He went to Yale University. And while he was at Yale University, he went to a revival meeting for the college students. During that time, there was an invitation given to those who wished to believe in Jesus Christ and to give themselves to the gospel. And in this particular invitation, their invitation was, if you wish to believe in Jesus Christ and the gospel, would you rise from your seats and go to another room? His testimony, he was moved, Aaron was moved, deeply moved by the Spirit to become a Christian. And he went along with a few other young fellows. And as he passed... Someone said, look at Aaron going into that room. And Aaron said, he turned and came back and said, I was only fooling and never trusted Jesus Christ. You don't know him for that story. You know him for a little better story because his last name was Aaron Burr, a traitor to the United States of America. But by his testimony, the time that he almost trusted Jesus Christ, but was embarrassed of the gospel because of fear of fellows. Don't let fear or embarrassment keep you from the gospel. Sometimes people are embarrassed to not accept the gospel because they had a bad experience, perhaps even at church. Or they met a Christian who was a hypocrite. And my friend, there are hypocrites everywhere you go. In church and out of church. I wish it wasn't the case in church. I wish everyone at church was genuine and perfect. But Jesus is the only perfect one. And there will be hypocrites at church. There are also hypocrites outside of church. In fact, if we're to study scripture, we'll find out that one of the apostles was the biggest hypocrite of them all. A man by the name of Judas fooled all the other apostles and the disciples, fooled them all. None of them thought it was Judas even when he got up to, de to, to be betray Jesus Christ. They didn't think it was Judas. He was that good of a hypocrite. And he's not in heaven. He's not in heaven. If we use the excuse, well, that person is not genuine, we can always find someone who ought to be better. We can always find someone who will be hypocritical. Or we use foolish excuses. I'll do it later. Or it's too easy. See, the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Someone said this, those people who expect salvation at the 11th hour often die at 1030. The gift of God, salvation. Sometimes the thought is, well, this seems too simple. Just believe Jesus Christ. I can't accept that. I was reminded of a situation that I went through. I was a sophomore in college. Went on a mission trip. Went on a mission trip to some Hispanic country, went to Mexico, went to the Dominican Republic, and went to Puerto Rico. 12-week short-term mission trip, ministering in different, three different places, different people. During our time in Mexico, 
We went to some small outlier villages, some places that still at that time, 20 years ago now, still did not have indoor plumbing or running water. Ministering there. There was one particular village that we went to. Toward the end of this trip, about 10 weeks in, almost at the end of our trip, this village was an extremely poor village. We had held services, some revival services. In fact, I'd taken my trombone and and I had played my trombone up and down the streets, and the kids, like the Pied Piper, would follow me back to the service. All right? They had, many of them had probably never seen at that point a trombone before and had never heard me play it that poorly, so it was exciting for them. Had services that particular week at this small village, ministered to the young people, played some soccer with them. At the end of the week, or, or, I'm sorry, one night playing soccer, one of the young boys that I kind of become close to, one of the teenage boys, um, not too far off in age from where I was at at the time, had a Nike shirt on. He had wore the same shirt, I believe, most of the week. And I said, that's a nice looking shirt, just being nice, just being kind. Fast forward into the week, time to leave, almost to the end of our mission trip in general. I think we're heading back to one other place for one more week. A lot of tears being shed by, by everyone, right? This young boy, this teenage boy, comes up to me and he has this shirt folded in his hands. He goes to hand it to me. I remember standing there like completely lost. Because this boy had worn this shirt most of the week. Obviously it was his pride and joy. It was a nice Nike like soccer jersey. With a little collar on it, zipped up, a little quarter zip on it. I remember there in the moment, like everything coming together in my mind and thinking to myself, I have so many clothes. I'm not the richest person, but I had probably more clothes in my closet than this young man had had his whole entire life. I probably washed more clothes in a week than he owned. And here he was, literally giving me the shirt off his back. I tell you right now, at that moment... I was embarrassed. I was reluctant. I was ashamed to take his gift. I was ashamed. I felt I didn't deserve that kind of gift. What did I do? Come for a little bit and, and, and try to be a blessing. I felt I didn't deserve that gift. And the fact is I didn't deserve that gift. I didn't deserve it. And I had a choice to make. I did not want to accept that gift. Because in one sense, I felt, you have more need of it than me. But in the other sense, I knew that if I didn't accept it, there'd be great offense there, as you can imagine. And so humbly, ashamedly, embarrassingly, he accepted that gift. And the smile on his face so I accepted a gift from this young boy. My mind's still there. I can see him to this day. Yet Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes down and says, I have a gift for you. It's me. Gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, all you have to do is accept the gift. And some are ashamed. They're embarrassed. They're reluctant to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friends, simple, simple this morning. Have you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ? Not if you've been baptized here. Not if you've been in church here your whole life. Not if you've memorized portions of the Bible. Not if you can sing with the best voice known to man, but have you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ? I imagine this morning there are some in here who need to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps even some who have been here a long time. In your heart, right here, you know what you need to do. You know you need to accept Jesus Christ. But at that same moment, there are these other competing, conflicting thoughts. What will people think? What will they say? Is it really that easy? Does God really love me? All those things that will cause us to be ashamed, embarrassed, or reluctant of the gospel. This morning, 
and courage. Embrace the gospel. Book of Acts. Paul was witnessing. Witnessing to a king. Had a compelling message of the gospel. The king at the end, King Agrippa, so close. He says these telling words. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Words that will damn someone to hell in separation from God forever. Almost. Today, don't be almost. Accept Jesus Christ. Thank you.